Well, here we are in our final message in this series. And honestly, these past few weeks, my goal has really been to present to you the tension of fighting and flourishing, the beauty and the bravery that it takes to get there, the, the difficulty alongside the determination to just keep showing up and keep showing up, uh, the growth with the grief, the heartache um, that goes hand in hand with the happiness, the pain and the passion, the ache in our soul and the abundant life that we were born to live, the loss and the lightheartedness, the strength and the struggle, the distress and the delight, both and, hand in hand. And it's like this, this cover, and um, a lot of people have been asking me, um, uh, what's the story behind the cover? Uh, is it about leopards? Is it about the jungle? Is it about the garden? And I say yes, actually, to, to all those things. It's about the beauty that comes from a fierceness deep inside. It's about the grit of a heart in the midst of the jungle of the unknown and of the pain. It's about what happens in the garden, the fight for growth and the fight for flourishing. And really, to sum it all up, I found this version in Philippians, um, Philippians 1, 6. It says, there has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. God started it all. He started this party. He started the work inside us. And like another version says, it says that he will be faithful to complete it. And this week, I've called this message, the leopard, the lines, and the rose. If you're taking notes, since you're taking notes, the leopard, the lines, and the rose. First of all, the leopard. And honestly, I learned a lot about leopards, but didn't put all the things that I wanted to in this book. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about leopards today. Uh, basically, they are the smartest of the big cats. They are cunning and stealthy hunters. They use surprise and ambush tactics as they hunt. And they are savage. I literally watched a video of a leopard killing a cheetah. That was so crazy to watch. Um, they're not as strong as lions, and tigers, but they're smarter with strategy, agility, and ability. Um, they're the fastest and the strongest climbers, and they actually have extra strength in them that God gave them and stamina to be able to pull their prey up in the trees. They've learned that they have to pull their prey up into the trees so that nothing else will, will get the, the, the meal, so that they'll only get it. Um, they're graceful. Uh, their brilliant coat that God actually designed for them to be camouflage for them, for them to stay alive. And I just, I love, I love it. I love it so much. Um, and in the words of one big game hunter in Africa, he said, besides his incredible strength, the leopard moves at blinding speed from close quarters and is noted for his patience, calculating intelligence, hair-raising ferocity, and boldness wrapped in the best camouflage in nature beside a fashion model. And he also said this. He said, I would rather hunt a leopard than any other species because of the challenge of it. And if that doesn't tell you how amazing leopards are, if a, a hunter is like, hey, I just want to hunt them because uh, it's so challenging. But like the leopard, it takes a deep strength, stealth, agility, and grace to keep showing up, to let the trials of this life not take us out, but to do the work in our souls to help us to give us the strength to continue on in this life we're called to live. And my prayer for you is that you would be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, and that you would grow in this fierceness, in this strength to continue through the pain, through the trial, so that this trial will do the deep work that it's meant to do in your soul. We've learned in this collection of messages in this Fight to Flourish series. Uh, one, that we were born to fight, 
and Born to Flourish, that the good parts and the hard parts of this life tend to go hand in hand, and that we were meant to shine in the dark, that it's possible to not give up, but to keep showing up. And I hope you already have your own copy. I hope you have gotten the audio book, however, the e-book, however the best is for you to read it, because there's so much in here that I have not been able to include in this series. So make sure you have it if you, um, you get it if you haven't already. But as we come to a close, as we wrap a bow around this series, so to speak, I want to talk about the fact that God fights for you. God fights for you. Yes, you're meant to be a strong runner. Yes, you're meant to fight hard like a boxer. Yes, you're meant to have a stealth like a leopard, but you're meant to fight with his strength in you, not in your own strength. Ephesians 6.10 says, Now, my beloved ones, I have saved these most important truths for last. Be supernaturally infused with strength, through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious with the force of his explosive power flowing in and through you. How do we access this strength? Didn't you see it? Through your life union with the Lord Jesus. We can stand victorious because of what Jesus did for us. And what did he do? Well, That's where we go to the lines, the finish line. We talked a little bit about this the first week, and I love this so much, how Jesus already ran this race. He did the ultimate work of coming down from heaven, living perfectly as man and God at the same time, which, speaking of tension, what more intense tension is that, being fully God and fully man? I can't even comprehend it. But I love this. Jesus ran the race. He completed the task. He did what he, what we couldn't do so that we could enjoy life with him now and forever on into eternity. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. I love how another version says, the author and the finisher of our faith. He started it. He'll complete it. He lived He died on the cross, he rose from the dead, and he took his seat in heaven. He ran the race, and he alone gives us the strength for ours, so we can live from his finish line. And I love this so much because it gives us such strength, such victory as we run our race, knowing that it's not about us and our strength. It's about going from him and where he finished. The finish line is where we start. Doesn't that give us such strength in our bones and and life in our soul? Yes, we start at the, the beginning, we start with those, uh, the starter blocks, and we, we start in our lane, and we run. But we're not running in our own strength. We're running from the finish line that Jesus already did for us. And I love this. When we give our lives to Christ, he is the one who starts it, and he is the one who's going to finish it. We just have to rely on his strength every day, rely on what he did, rely on who he is every single day. I love how the psalmist in Psalm 71 says, God, don't just watch from the sidelines. 
Come on, run to my side. I'll write the book on your righteousness. I'll talk up your salvation the live long day. Never run out of good things to write or say. I come in the power of the Lord God. I post signs marking his right of way. I love that. God, don't just watch on the sidelines. Don't just, don't look there. Just be here with me and help me run. Help me go. Psalm 16 says, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. The borders of my life, what God has allowed for me and where I'm at right now, I can say it's pleasant for me because God is with me. And what he has begun in me, he will complete it. And that verse again, I just love this verse, Philippians 1, 6. There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind. Let this rumble around in your soul. That the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. What hope that is for us. We also began the series with the seed packet. And this is such a, a beautiful picture, and I, I'm, I'm such a visual person, but I, I love this picture. And just to kind of wrap it up and bring it back to this as well, when you look at a seed packet, you see on the front of it what the seed is meant to become. And it's so amazing, and it takes faith, because when you look at the seed, it does not look amazing. It does not look like the, the sunflower on the front of the, the seed packet. It takes faith to know that what it consists of inside the seed is everything it needs to become what's on the seed packet. But for us, God has for us to grow into this uh, vibrant, uh, blooming, flourishing version of us that he created us to be. And that's what's on the seed packet. But also, it's a picture of Jesus. Because we, as we have given our lives to Christ, as we, as we have called on his name, we are meant to become more and more like Jesus every day. And honestly, I don't want to live my life from the sidelines. I don't want to be looking at the lanes and seeing what could have been or only watching what others are doing. I want to engage. I want to immerse myself in the lines of my lane. I want to run hard. I want to run steady with his breath in my lungs and with his spirit in me and his power fueling me. And I pray the same for you. And that leads me to the rose. And spoiler alert, I end the book with the rose. Well, my husband and I were in Sonoma County recently. Uh, we were driving around and looking at all the, um, the vineyards, and it was so be beautiful. It was harvest time, which we didn't know when we were there that it, was gonna, that it was harvest time, but it was. And so we see all of these grapes hanging on the vine. It's so beautiful. Um, in the middle of me being car sick and kind of resting my eyes, as I like to call it, um, I would look and see that at the end of every vineyard row was a rose bush. And so I asked our friend who was with us, I was like, what is that all about? Why are there rose bushes at the end of every row? And he said that sometimes uh, bugs or infestation or disease or mildew will come in and the rose being tender, uh, it will take what's going on and it will show the signs of it. And so the, the vineyard worker, the vineyard dresser will see, oh, wow, there's something happening to the rose bush. It, it'll give me time to spray what needs to be sprayed, to tend to the vines, to make sure that they don't get what, ha what is showing up in the roses. And how beautiful is that, that literally the rose is taking the brunt. It's like putting itself in the front line, putting itself in front of the, the, the vine, the vineyard, taking the hit of the disease or the mildew or the, the bugs so that the vineyard can live. And Levi and I looked at each other and were like, what the heck? 
Hello, Jesus, the one who took our shame, the one who took our sin on his shoulders so that we wouldn't be crushed by it, so that we could live and not just live, but live abundantly and live flourishingly. Charles Spurgeon wrote this. Whatever there may be of beauty in the material world, Jesus Christ possesses all that in the spiritual world in a tenfold degree. Amongst the flowers, the rose is deemed the sweetest. But Jesus is infinitely more beautiful in the garden of the soul than the rose can in the garden of earth. I am the rose of Sharon. This was the best and rarest of roses. Jesus is not the rose alone. He is the rose of Sharon. Just as he calls his righteousness gold, and then adds the gold of Ophir, the best of the best. He is positively lovely and superlatively the loveliest. Who is this rose? This is Jesus. This is Jesus who we love, who we worship, who we sing about. The prophet Isaiah prophesied about Jesus before he ever came. And you've probably heard this in the context of Christmas. But here in Isaiah 9, he says, But there won't be any more sadness for those who are suffering. The people who are now living in darkness will see a great light. They are living in a very dark land, but a light will shine on them. Lord, you will make our nation larger. You will increase their joy. They will show you how glad they are. They will be as glad as people who are at harvest time. They will be as glad as warriors are when they share the things they've taken after a battle. You set Israel free from Midian long ago. In the same way, you will break the heavy yoke that weighs Israel down. You will break the wooden beams that are on their shoulders. You will break the rods of those who strike them down. And he, Jesus, will be called wonderful advisor and mighty God. He will also be called Father who lives forever and Prince who brings peace. There will be no limit to how great his authority is. The peace he brings will never end. This is Jesus, the Savior of the world, our Rose of Sharon, the most beautiful, the loveliest, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And this rose, Jesus, is with you. In his presence is true peace. I want Jesus. I want more of him. And like C.S. Lewis says, said, <laughs> I want Christ, not something that resembles him. I want Christ. I want him. I don't want anything that resembles him. I want him. I want the rose of Sharon. I want the loveliest of all creation. I want Jesus. I want him, my Savior, my Lord, my God. John 3.16 says, This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, Anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. God sent Jesus so we wouldn't be destroyed. He's the rose saving the vineyard so the vineyard wouldn't be destroyed. So we wouldn't die apart from him. He has saved us, he is with us, and he fights for us. The rose fights for you. You are not alone. He fights for you, he fights through you. And I believe that you can flourish now because he already fought for you. I believe that you can flourish now because he continues to fight for you. I wanna talk about leopard spots. And I have this little video of leopards going on as I talk about this. But the brilliant coat pattern that covers the leopard is called rosettes, tiny roses. And when I found this out, it honestly, it's such a small thing, but it hit me because we're meant to be like Jesus. 
as we live this flourishing life that God's called us to, we're meant to follow him. We're meant to walk with him. We're meant to love like he loves. We're meant to be little roses. And the name Christian means little Christ. And originally it was a name of mockery given to people who followed Jesus, if you see in Acts 11. But what's so beautiful is that, I mean, when you look at the leopard, you see the spots. And for me, when I saw how it's supposed to be camouflaged, I was like, how is a leopard with spots camouflaged in the wild? That didn't make sense to me. But when I learned that it's a leopard on the move, it's when the leopard is on the move that the pattern of his coat blends in perfectly with the background. And the camouflage simulates the shifting sunlight that falls on plants and shadows. So it's when the leopard is on the move. And I believe that that is the same for you and for me. That as we're on the move, we're meant to follow Jesus. We're meant to be these little roses that point to who he is. Jesus gave us the pattern of how to live, of how to give. He shows the way because he is the way. He also showed us what real love is. If you look at 1 John chapter 4, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how we know, here it is. This is how we know God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In verse 19, it says, we love because he first loved us. We are rosettes. We are meant to be the tiny pictures of the real rose. We're meant to point to the rose of all roses, to be the most, to the most beautiful of all. The only way we can love is because he first loved us. And I want to end here in a passage of scripture that you, you may be so familiar with, which I hope you are. And if you're not, I want to encourage you to memorize this. This is in Romans 8. Starting in verse 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. He appointed them to be saved in keeping with his purpose. God planned that those he had chosen would become like his son. In that way, Christ will be the first and most honored among many brothers and sisters. And those God has planned for, he has appointed to be saved. Those he has appointed, he has made right with himself. To those he has made right with himself, he has given his glory. What should we say then? Since God is on our side, who can be against us? God did not spare his own son. He gave him up for us all. Then won't he also freely give us everything else? Who can bring any charge against God's chosen ones? God makes us right with himself. Then who can sentence us to death? No one. Christ Jesus is at the right hand of God and is also praying for us. He died. More than that, he was raised to life. Who can separate us from Christ's love? Can trouble or hard times or harm or hunger? Can nakedness or danger or war? No. In all these things, we are more than winners. We owe it all to Christ who has loved us. I am absolutely sure that not even death or life can separate us from God's love not even angels or demons, the present or the future, or any powers can separate, not even the highest places or the lowest, or anything else in all creation can separate us. Nothing at all can ever separate us from God's love. That's because of what Christ Jesus, our Lord, has done. God's love changes us. 
and nothing can separate us from his love. What you're fighting through right now, the difficulty, the pain, the shame, the heartache, nothing can separate you from his love. And yes, we run hard, we run to win, but we are more than winners in Christ. So we don't just fight with his power, we win and we more than win. And I don't even know exactly what that means, but I'm in, I'm all into this. I'm all into being found in his love. Romans five says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. When you know you're loved, it changes the way you live. And I wanna share with you this song, it's called Loved. And it's a special one in our family. Our friend Shayla wrote it. And even the week uh, that Lenny went to heaven, I, I was talking with Shayla before and she was telling me that she was in the middle of writing songs and um, she had no idea as she was writing this song what was gonna be happening this week, that week. And Shayla and Leon, um, sang and, and did this song at Lenya's Celebration of Life, but I wanted to share it with you today. And I would love for you just to, to sit, maybe close your eyes and allow this song to wash over you.
Thank you, guys. I talk about the the meaning behind it and why Shayla wrote it in the book, and it's such a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, but I just want to take a moment now and and pray. Father, I thank you so much for your faithfulness. I thank you so much, God, for your love. You're so good. You're so kind. I thank you that you don't leave us alone. You don't save us and then let us try to figure it out on our own. You you save us and you desire a rich relationship with us where we're running to you and, and singing to you and talking with you and um, holding on tight to you and we don't know what's going on around us. And I just pray right now for those who needed this reminder that you fight for them and that you love them and that they're not alone. I pray that this would refresh their hearts and recharge them. Because when we know we're loved, it changes the way we live. And Lord, your love changes everything. And we want to rest in your love. And I also just want to take a moment and pray for anyone who doesn't know Jesus, who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, who in talking with all all of these things has now realized that Jesus is the rose. If that's you, I want to pray a prayer with you a prayer of salvation where you call out to God and you say that you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead. And this is um, so beautiful, such a beautiful moment. And I wanna lead you in this prayer. You can just repeat after me out loud where you are right now. You can say, dear God, I see that you sent Jesus. I see that I needed a savior, that I was stuck on my own and I couldn't get out by myself. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for his life and his death and his resurrection. Thank you that it's this resurrection power that gives me the power to live this life you've called me to live. I trust you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.